who convince you that black holes play an important part in shaping the, the history of our universe. Okay, so this is inevitably going to be based on the Eagle Project, so thank you to my collaborators. Uh, I highlight the paper that I wrote in 2017 that contains a lot of the discussion of this model. And then at the end, I'm going to try and add some stuff talking about the role of mergers as well as halo mass in, in shaping the way the universe behaves. Okay, Stuma Calpine, that'll be coming out soon. Okay, so. Uh, just to reiterate from where Abishai started this morning, if you think about the galaxy stellar mass function, so the abundance of galaxies as a function of their halo mass, this has very little to do with the cold dark matter mass function shown by the red line there. And we need to explain why galaxies don't get more abundant as they get fainter. Well, that's an idea that's been around for quite some time. The, in small halos, the galaxies are much less bound, so it's easy for a small amount of star formation to remove a large amount of material, and galaxy formation is very inefficient. But what I want to focus on is the question of what creates this break. So if we go to high masses, we find that whilst there are plenty of halos, at higher masses, the abundance of galaxies drops off very rapidly, and there's this exponential decline. Now, so one idea that's been around is that this is something to do with the suppression of cooling in hydrostatic halos. Okay. And maybe we could explain that uh, Energy input from black holes prevents these hydrostatic halos from cooling down. But the picture I want to explain is about trying to explain why it picks out this characteristic scale here. And a key message for you to take away is this is the point at which galaxy formation is just getting very efficient. Okay, very. And so there's this interaction between the feedback that comes from supernovae and the feedback that you get from black holes. And these interplay with each other to explain the shape of the mass function. Now we know observationally that if we look at the evolution of the mass function, the break position here really doesn't change very much as you go back in time. So not only is this uh, characteristic scale here, uh, at, a at a particular, particular mass is picked out, out that, that mass doesn't, doesn't change very much with redshift. And if I break the galaxy population into passive and active galaxies, you can see that over time, passive galaxies build up at this kind of characteristic mass, creating the evolution of the mass function as seen in observations. Okay, now I'll skip that. If we and move to the, the Eagle simulation. Now, so Eagle, we were very pleased to be able to reproduce the observed galaxy mass function looking like this. Okay, now that's not a, um, a completely a priori prediction, but it turns out that the position of the break here is actually very insensitive to the way we treat the black hole physics. So I'll show you later on and explain why that is. Okay, so the beauty of having a simulation like this is it's not the real universe, but because it incorporates as the best we can do as to the physics of the real universe, it gives us a way to understand what's happening when we look at observations. So I want you to view the Eagle simulation here as a tool for understanding the physics of galaxy formation. Right, so a, a plot that I skipped over earlier was to compare the, the, star, stellar, the star formation rates of galaxies as a function of halo mass. Now, as you can imagine from the, the break of the mass function as being the place where galaxies build up in stellar mass, I can also plot this as plotting the, the growth time scale of the galaxy due to star formation versus 
the, the stellar mass of galaxies. And galaxies make a transition here from active galaxies, where the, the stellar mass is growing on a time scale that's much shorter than the age of the universe, to systems that are about, that are, have growth time scales that are much longer than the age of the universe. Okay. And there's this particular transition mass scale that corresponds to the same mass scale that creates the break in the galaxy mass function. Now, the black contours here are data. This is now data at redshift one, showing that this, this uh, transition mass occurs in the data. But the points here are the same way of plotting the eagle simulations. So each galaxy here is one galaxy sample from galaxies in the eagle simulation. And you can see that they produce this bimodality that's seen in the data. You get active sequence of galaxies, active star-forming galaxies, and then a sequence of passive galaxies up there. Now what's remarkable and what's very striking about this plot is that if you color the points by the black hole mass of the, that the galaxies contain, you can see there's a strong connection, things that have, unusual, that have large black hole mass relative to their stellar mass, lie at the top of, above the dashed line. The things that lie on the blue sequence tend to have relatively small black hole masses. And although there are a range of stellar masses, the galaxies around the break before they become passive, this is always connected with the mass of the black hole within them. So this is a smoking gun that in Eagle, again, this is something we can look at in detail in the simulation and hopefully infer that this is something that happens in the real world. So let's look at black hole mass now as a function of the halo mass. You can see that rather than having a linear correlation between halo mass and the black hole mass, there's a very noticeable break in this relationship. Okay, so, galaxy, so black holes in halo masses that are uh, below around about 10 to the 12 tend to be small. They don't get smaller than this because there's a, a mass at which we inject black holes into the simulation. There's a mass scale at which they grow rapidly by an order of magnitude in mass and then they grow along a sequence up here. And we kind of understand uh, there's rapid transition occurring here in the properties of the black holes. Now something I want to stress is that the, the model for that determines the accretion rate of the black hole knows nothing about the halo mass. It knows nothing about the black hole mass, it just knows about the properties of gas surrounding the black hole. So the existence of this rapid transition must be associated with the physics of galaxy formation. It's not something we built into the code from the outset. So an individual black hole will first track along, it follows a very similar sequence it turns out, as the halo mass grows very little gas is accreted by the black hole. When I reach a halo mass of around 10 to the 12, there's a rapid growth in the black hole, and I'll explain why that happens in a moment. And then in higher mass halos, there's a sort of self-regulation phase. And we can understand this phase as being the energy output from the black hole is basically being able to almost unbind the halo that surrounds the galaxy. And so there's a regulation in this regime between black hole mass and halo mass. So the puzzle with this plot is really why don't black holes grow in this regime and then why do they grow so rapidly thereafter? Okay, no movies. I haven't got time for movies. Blame the chairman. All right, okay, so simple analytic model. So what, what's nice is to, you've got a simulation. You don't really, you know the microphysics that's been programmed into that simulation. But um, we don't know the, uh, how that microphysics interacts with itself, and that's something we would like to get at. 
But it's a fantastic tool because I can take this and try to then write down a very simple analytic model that explains that behavior. Now, one of the first things to notice is that the rate of accretion onto a black hole in the Bondi regime is proportional to the black hole mass squared. Okay, so this means as the black hole doubles in mass, the accretion rate goes up by a factor of four. So this is a much faster than exponential growth of black holes, but it's mediated by the density of the surrounding material. So this can create a, a, a switch. If I push the density up a little bit, get the black hole to begin growing in mass, suddenly the rate of growth will kick off and become extremely fast. Okay, now, um, it's important to stress we're not simply using the Bondi formula. We're accounting for the angular momentum of material around the black hole. But it turns out that this is the important thing from the physics. And so there's a feedback loop that emerges linking the growth of the black hole to the density of the material that surrounds it. Okay, we'll skip that. Okay, so this is what would happen if you integrate that equation. You grow very rapidly in mass at a finite time. Okay, but what picks out now why a particular halo mass triggers this phase of very rapid growth? Well, to understand that, we need to think about what's regulating the density of the material around the black hole. Okay, and the, the idea that I'm putting forward here differs from Avishai's perspective on this, in that I'm gonna focus on the buoyancy of material heated by supernova. So rather than trying to drive a wind out of the galaxy by using the kinetic energy of the material that's heated by supernova feedback, I wanna focus on the buoyancy. So simply heating the material so that it has a higher entropy than the surroundings will make that material rise and pass through any corona that's there. Material will rise, be able to leave the galaxy. Supernovae can regulate the density of material and therefore stop material getting dense around the black hole. But it turns out that what happens, these, this is the adiabat. Um, so here we have the density of material plotted against its temperature for, for three different halo masses across the transition regime. Now you can first of all see that if you go to a low mass halo, two things are going on. One, there's very little hot corona. If the hot corona gets dense, it cools, so you can only sustain a weak corona. But also, the adiabat of the wind produced by the galaxy is above the adiabat of the corona. So that material can just float out of the galaxy. It doesn't need to be pushed, it'll just float. If you need to, to experience that, get a bottle and play with it in the bath. It's really fun. Now, the, uh, if you go to the critical transition around 10 to the 12 halo mass, there's beginning to become more of a hot corona and the age of that, the material is now becoming trapped. So although I heat the material with the supernovae, it won't rise and be a prop and flow out to large radii. It's trapped in the center and able to cool. And if I go to very massive things, this then becomes a very strong hot corona that traps any material in the center. Okay, now, in the paper, you can go and you can fold all these things. You can discover that this buoyancy model explains the faint end mass of the mass, the slope of the mass function, and explains the slight evolution of this critical mass with redshift. And so, the beauty of simulations is you can take your simple model and test it against what actually happens in the numerical code, which is, was, Quite, quite pleasing, pleasing. The, the agreement, agreement is not perfect, perfect of course. Okay. Now, now what, what does, does this, this look, look like, like uh, compared, compared to observations? To observations? Well, one, one question, question that I immediately hit is surely we know that black holes grow in proportion to the size of the galaxy. Well, that's largely a selection effect 
And if you go through all the data, people are used to seeing this diagram plotted against the bulge mass here. Observers are well aware of that, but maybe not theoreticians like me. And so the, if you now convert and plot the total stellar mass here, many of the things with small black holes end up on this side of the diagram. And the dashed line here is the relation predicted out of eagle. And that's not in bad agreement with what actually happens. Remember that these are the black holes that you can detect in a very limited subsample of galaxies. So those were direct detections where you really knew the mass of the black hole. Uh, Voluntary and Rhines have done a very similar thing, but now using H-alpha line widths to measure black hole masses. And again, you get this behavior, okay? This non-linear behavior here in the growth of black holes. Uh, all right, you just have to believe me that if you change the parameters of the model, you get remarkably close to the same answer. You can change various things about the assumed interstellar medium subgrid physics, about the black hole physics. The only way you change this relation is to remove supernova feedback. And then in that case, the black holes end up having just a linear relationship with mass. Okay. Now, the, the new bit I want to add in two minutes is uh, about galaxy mergers. So, We've long thought that galaxy mergers were a great way to fuel material into the centers of galaxies. But I'm arguing that the thing that's relevant is whether the supernovae can expel material from galaxies and stop the buildup of material at the center. So we were very interested to go and show that mergers were completely unimportant. The trouble with grad students is they have a habit of showing that you're wrong, right? So this is the work done by Stu McAlpine, and what he did was to go and look at the accretion rate of the black hole as a function of time, identify the peak of this very fast growth phase for the black hole, associate that with a, a time for the, for the period of growth for the black hole, and then uh, take these times and compare them to the merger histories of galaxies. And something he did very carefully was to make sure that there was a control sample created by taking this growth period for one galaxy and using it against the formation history of a different galaxy. So you can see where there's an excess or is it just that there are more mergers at an earlier time. So this is what he found. This is measuring how many di dynamical time scales after, in that direction or before a merger, do you get this period of black hole growth? Why does that wait until... No, I don't want to wait. It. Cancel right back to play. Okay, and so what's plotted here is the control sample, and you can see basically there's no enhancement of merger events near random periods of time in the history of galaxies. But to my annoyance, you find quite a big increase in the occurrence of this rapid growth phase just after a merger in the galaxy's history. And so what he finds is that actually, although your uh, growth of the black hole is indeed determined by the halo mass, so you don't get this rapid growing phase in low mass halos, you do get it associated in roughly 50% of the galaxy, but then we can only trace down to 10 to the 1 mergers with um, a period of rapid accretion uh, causing that growth. And finally, you can ask, well now should I then, if I go find, select a sample of galaxies observationally, should I find a connection between their activity and the mergers? And the answer is, 
if the Eddington rate is high, yes. The Eddington rate is low, the enhancement is very weak. So this should be observable. Okay, so thank you very much. What I want you to remember is that black holes are cool and determine the entire history of the universe. Maybe that's overstating things a little bit. Thank you. There's the, the, the 2017 describes the analytic model, the, the, the basic model. Uh, yeah. yeah. Stu McAlpine is just about to finish a paper on the role of mergers and look at the uh, predictions for what you might see in observations. Yeah, 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 yeah. You usually do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's no, really it's interesting, interesting that this is emerging. You know, we, we, we tested it by looking at variations on our model, but it's, it's great, great that you're seeing the equivalent of stuff. Well, then, well that's, that's, that's uh, one of the interesting things, things, things from being here, here is to go, oh, why don't we look at how, how compact the end products, products were, right? So, right. so we, we see different results depending on, there are small differences depending on whether you were triggered by a merger or not, okay? But probably there are other ways of making the, ga making the gas compact, funneling it down to the black hole. We haven't looked at how compact the end, uh, end galaxy is, but it would be interesting to look at that. Yeah, there's a, it, unfortunately, it's only a simulation. So there's a limit to how much I believe that small scale structure in this, right? The disk structure is quite hard for things that are very small because of the way we treat the interstellar medium. But you shouldn't stop us having a look, right? Oh, and you didn't get the movie. You didn't get.